Amen. Well, does anybody have anything on their heart, anything at all they need to say or do at this time? Well, again, I want to say I appreciate the Lord and thankful for the service this morning and the liberty that we had, uh, thankful for the opportunity to stand and preach, thankful for the opportunity to tell about the love of God. Is there a better thing to talk about today? I doubt it. Amen. Amen. And uh, I know, I know that there were lost people in that service and I know that they needed to get saved. We need to be praying for lost souls, amen? And so continue to do that. I'm going to be back in John tonight, John chapter 4. As a matter of fact, John chapter 4. And uh, back in the must statements of John's gospel. The must statements of John's gospel. We have covered quite a few of them at this time. Uh, last Sunday night, we were in John 4. And uh, in this same kind of story we're in tonight, uh, dealing with that woman from Samaria and how that the Lord Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria and dealt with the uh, desire for lost souls and, and the need to continue to have a radar for lost people. And, and you know, we need not forget that. Amen? Amen? Uh, and let me just encourage you, you know, it's, it is uncomfortable to give somebody a gospel track on your flesh. Your flesh don't like that. But, you, you know, you just keep doing it and learn from your mistakes. And learn from your mistakes. Brother Beckham knows about that. Amen. <laughs> he told me about giving a gospel track out. And, and he said something along the lines of, how was it you said it, Brother Beckham? Okay, so we were going Go through, ahead, yes. We were going through Wendy's and uh, Terry said, here, give, give this to her. Yes. And I said, oh, uh, and just kind of put it in front of her. And I said, stick this in your pocket. And I'm certain she thought I was giving her a ticket. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. But but you know what? He gave her something worth a whole lot more than money. Amen. 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 And uh, and I'm thankful that Brother Beckham did that. I'm thankful that Miss Terry and him are are working on that. And that's a blessing. Let me encourage you. Figure out how to do it. Make a habit of it. I had an old boy at one of these restaurants. I don't remember which one it was. You know how it is. You get in the hustle of it all, and you're popping in and out of restaurants here and there. And he was friendly. He was being friendly to me and asking me about my truck and stuff. And I thought, you know what? <laughs> There's been many a days I would never have even thought about giving him a gospel track. And so I, I gave it to him. I said, hey, you know, let me give you this. Jesus loves you. Best thing ever happened to me. That's not hard, is it, church? Huh? Talk to me a minute. That's not hard, is it? You can do that. You should be doing that. You should be doing something to try to reach lost people with the gospel. And so tonight we're in John chapter 4 again. We're looking at the next must statement. And this one has a little bit more thought takes a little bit more thought, if you will, a little bit more study. It's good. It's really good. John chapter 4, look at verse 21. If you're there, say amen. 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 Brother Zach, if you could, I'm going to need water. John chapter 4, verse 21, it says, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. 
God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That'll be all the reading this morning, or this evening rather, and uh, here we are. The next must statement of, of John's gospel, and we find it there in, of course, verse 24. The Bible says, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And it's vitally important today, young people and adults alike, that we are familiar with the topic of worship. Every time we go to church, we go to what we want to call a worship service. Listen to me. But sadly, many times, very, very, very little worship takes place in the lives of God's people. Worship is an important attribute to the believer. We are to be faithfully, thank you, look at that. That'll work, that'll wait. We are to be faithfully worshiping the Lord. Worship. And so I'm going to give you some points here. I've got an outline put together. And we're going to go with this verse here and try our best to, to glean a little bit of truth from this must statement. I want you to notice the who of worship. Hey, youngins, y'all need me to separate you? Y'all going, going to listen? Okay. The who of worship. The who. We're talking about the who of worship. Because here's the truth now. Are y'all ready? There's a lot of worship being done in our lives of objects that don't deserve worship. Amen. The Republican Party don't deserve worship. Amen. Fox News does not deserve worship. Amen. President Donald Trump does not deserve worship. Amen. The Democratic Party, MSNBC, President Joe Biden, same thing both ways. Neither direction should there be worship exercised in regards to those sources. Right. The Kentucky Wildcats don't deserve worship. Right. The Louisville Cardinals don't deserve worship. Right. It don't really matter what team you ascribe to, there's no such thing as a team that deserves worship. And when those things interfere with the main thing, we're in trouble. Uh, you know, this weekend, the Lord blessed me. I got to go down to Mississippi, do some duck hunting, had a great time. And I went down there with Brother Josh England, Brother Jesse Bragg, and Brother Josh, he's a Tennessee volunteer fan. And Brother Jesse Bragg is a bandwagon Georgia Bulldog fan. Amen. You say, why do you say that? He's from West Virginia, North Carolina. He's got no business rooting for them. He's just a bandwagon. Bless his heart. We'll pray for him, amen. amen. <laughs> but, uh, but no, we went down there, hung out, fellowshiped, had a great time together. Why? Because there's something else in our life that supersedes that nonsense. And guess what that is? That's nonsense. Anybody that lets that, and you say, Brother Shuttle, you're making, well, let me just tell you something. I've done it before in the past. Let competitive nature and, and things of, of, in those degrees interfere in my life because here's the truth. I was worshiping those things. And we ain't got no business doing that. Amen? And so we're here tonight to kind of be reminded about the importance of worshiping God. He's the one in this passage who is to receive worship. And we see that in the beginning of verse 24. God is a spirit. We're talking about worship. There in verse 23. The hour cometh, now is, when true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and true uh, and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. This is speaking about God the Father. And it's informing us of the need to worship him. And in order <coughs> for us to realize, or I guess you'd say to remind us about the importance and the need and, and the desire to worship God, 
is the fact that the Bible tells us that God is a spirit, a capital S spirit. And in this statement, there is some important truths, I believe, uh, that we as God's people need reminding of. The first thing that we need reminding about in the statement uh, that God is a spirit is the fact that God is has, if you will, invisible perception. Can't be seen. The Bible tells us this in a couple different locations. The book of Colossians in chapter 15, uh, 1 and verse 15 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, uh, uh, b- uh, for by him were all all things created. And so we see that uh, this statement that God, listen to me, is a spirit. He is spiritual. He is not physical. He does not bear the limitations of our physical body for he is a spirit. Uh, we see that he is uh, has invisible perception. You can't see him. Can't be seen. John chapter 1 tells us that no man hath seen God. Bible tells us that if we had the ability to see him, that it would be so hard on this flesh of ours that it would destroy it today. It's who God is. Who are we worshiping? Why we're worshiping the God of creation. He is a spirit. He has invisible perception. You can't see him. He has infinite presence in this spirit. Again, he is not limited by the boundary of a physical body. No, God has a spiritual body. And this spiritual body of God uh, does not have a, a limitation in his presence. He is everywhere today. God is everywhere today. In the book of Psalms chapter 139, the Bible tells us, Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Well, that was chapter 138. That's just as good. It's all good, amen. 139, 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, David said? Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? You can't get away from me. Boy, that's good today. I said you can't get away from him. Boy, I'm glad for the days when uh, as a lost young man I'd be in church and think if I could just get home maybe this conviction would get off of me. And I almost feel like sometimes it was stronger in my bed at night than it was sitting in the pew at church. Amen. Help me today if you know what I'm talking about in the fact that God is a spirit and his presence is not limited by a physical body. He has an infinite presence. It's everywhere and you can't get him off of you. Amen. He is the one to be worshipped. Who of our worship? Who is, who is the object of our worship? It is God. He is a spirit. He has an invisible perception. He has infinite presence. He has, excuse me, he has an indivisibly permanent presence. He is indivisibly permanent. You say, what do you mean? You can't divide him. Let me make a statement here. God is equally present in every place. This ain't the only church that God's at. I'm not the only Christian that God is in. And I didn't get more God than you got when you got saved. And you didn't get more God than I got when I got saved. He is everywhere permanently, equally present, indivisibly amongst all of existence. Now I will say this, there are places he's not welcome. And guess what? He's not going to frequent those places. A church that's not preaching sound biblical truth and doctrine and bringing in the conforming and molding that the world would have us to exhibit and participate in, God's not in favor of that. So how do you know, Brother Caleb? You think you know what God thinks? Well, I know what God said. Amen. And I know that God is not going to show himself somewhere that he is not welcome by an individual. The Bible said where two or three are gathered together in his name that he'll be in their midst. And let me just tell you something. I'm thankful for the times in my life when God was there. And I'm thankful that he is a spirit, the Bible said. That makes him worthy of our praise. Why? Because he's a whole lot more than any single man ever could be. He stands alone. He is God. He knows everything. 
He is omnipotent. He has all power. He's omnipresent. He is everywhere. He is omniscient. Listen here. Hey. He is omniscient. He knoweth everything. Are you listening to me? He knoweth everything. You're here today and you think, hey, I've got this place full. Ain't nobody here knows my spiritual estate, my spiritual condition. I'm lost and nobody knows it and I've got them fooled. Well, I know somebody you ain't got fooled. Did you hear me? I said, I know somebody you ain't got fooled. And he is all-knowing. And he is omnipresent. You're not going to get him off of you. You're not going to get away from him. He'll follow you to school. He'll follow you to work. He'll follow you home. He'll be right there the whole time working on you, reminding you of your lost estate. The Bible said that Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. And listen to me, friend. You got to get lost. You got to realize your lost estate. You got to come to terms with the understanding that if you die without God, you're going to go to hell. And if you'll get to that place and you'll turn to him, he will in no wise cast you out. This is the who of worship. We're to worship him. We're not to worship the pastor. I thank God for pastors. I thank God for a man that stood week after week and declared the truth of God's word with compassion and love to me and hundreds of others. I'm thankful for Sunday school teachers. I'm thankful for parents. None of these are to be worshipped. There's only one. Not only is there the who of worship, we see what is worship. Bible here again, God is a spirit and they that worship him. What is worship? Worship is defined from a word derived from worth and ship. Worth and ship. And it declares exactly what that says. Something that has much worth receives greater appreciation. Increased perception of the object will equal increased worship of the object. Are y'all listening to me? Say amen if you're with me. This is the definition. Primarily, church, the believer's worship is to the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can see the Trinity in this very verse of Scripture. Now let me remind you, uh, we serve a triune God. Amen? We don't worship the Father more than the Son, more than the Holy Spirit, or vice versa, or in any uh, other uh, mashup of, of our God, uh, for we serve a triune God. Amen? But the fact remains uh, uh, that our triune trinity of God uh, exists to help us and use all three parts of the trinity in order to give glory to God by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's inside of us. And the Holy Spirit in, initiates and facilitates the believer uh, to praise the Father and sitting at the right hand of the Father is the Son. And listen to me, and when we pray, uh, we're talking to the Father through the Son. We are the priest of our own soul. Amen. And therefore, this is how worship is accomplished. And it is to, uh, 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 to worship is to adore. It's to adore. It's to pay divine honor. This is the definition of worship. The demonstration of worship is done, listen to me, by the lowering of self. I've done it in the past for the sake of time. I didn't put the, the, the notes in, in today's message to do so, but you all know when you study the scriptures. And if you just kind of comb your way through the Bible, do a quick, simple study of the term worship, you know what you're going to find it? You're going to find it together uh, with other terms that involve the lowering of self. It is always accompanied by uh, being prostrate before God, laying down on your face. It, it's always accompanied by somebody, listen to me, that gets overwhelmed with God's goodness and is... Uh, 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 
somewhat, if you will, repentant about their sin or or, or sick of their flesh or sick of their, their sorrow. And, and when you find this worshiping of God throughout the scripture, you will find them uh, on their knees before God, on their face before God, lowering them, themselves, uh, 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 dumping ashes on themselves, things of this nature. Why? Because that is what worship is. Right. Worship is the lowering of self for the purpose of elevating God. Listen to me. Worship is the, is the getting self out of the way so that God might receive glory. That's what worship is. And that's how it's demonstrated, the lowering of self. Listen to me. The sacrificing of our, of our life, if you will, being that living sacrifice, guess what that is? That's worship. That's worship. Right. Pay attention. If we, can't sing, if we can't sing praises to God because we're afraid somebody will hear us and we don't like to be heard singing, we're worshiping ourselves. We've got to be that living sacrifice. That's just one example. When the Lord deals with our heart and we know we ought to go and get, get down before God and pray and we say, no, I can't do that. Somebody might see me or... Or somebody might think, I've got this going. Well, listen to me. You're worshiping yourself. Right. When the church has a need and, 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 and you see that need and God puts it on your heart to assist in that area and you say, no, I don't have time for that. I'll have to sacrifice. You're worshiping yourself. Who of worship is to be God? What of worship is to lower self? Get self out of the way. Say, God, it's not about me. It's about you. Have your will in spite of me. If that means use me, God, use me in spite of me. If that means use somebody else, God, use them. Because it's not about me being worshipped. It's about him being worshipped. How many of y'all is with me still? Say amen. The demonstration, it's to celebrate him. It's to submit to him. There is trepidation. Reverence. Lord, there is, yes. Worship bears reverence. It's a holy thing here at the church. It's not a joke. It's not a joke. God, that we should never even make a joke about God. Don't include God in a joke. Make that a serious point in your life. It's dangerous. Why? Because you want to guard your heart from, from thinking that he's not worthy of your reverence and trepidation. Am I okay? We, we, we must. We must be. A, it's, it's a serious thing. God's a serious thing. Let me tell you something. Joking about the things of God and the people of God is a dangerous thing. I've been around young people, and, and look, I, you know, I've struggled with maturity. Y'all know my heart. I, bless the Lord. Amen. But I'll say this. When we start making fun, mimicking, mocking God's people who are in the act of worship, as far as that person's concerned, they're... They're giving God praise and worship. They might, they might have, look here, listen to me young people. They might not have the prettiest cry face. And they may exhibit a sound when they cry or testify that might have, you know, a little bit of different pitch to it that you find humorous, but you better guard yourself. Amen. Why? Because it's for him. And it to be, it's to be revered. This bunch of joking about the things of God, mocking what goes on with God's people around God's church, making fun of preaching, making fun of the way preachers preach. Somebody that is worshiping God the best that they can, sacrificing their flesh and doing what God would have them to do. Are y'all with me? 
Y'all understand what I'm trying to say? It's a, it's a reverential emotion expression to God. We got to be careful. Got to be careful about that. Making jokes, mocking. Vain janglings, the Bible calls it. There's a demonstration, there's a distinction. You know what the Bible tells us there in verse 23? <clears throat> the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers. There's a distinction, isn't it? You say, what's the distinction, Brother Caleb? True versus false. Look up here. True versus false. Real versus fake. How many of y'all have heard Brother Caleb make his statement? And I've heard preachers say this. Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. If service is, is dry, work something up. Fake it. Nope. Nope. That's not scriptural. Nowhere is that found in the Bible. Nowhere is God an endorser of faking worship. Nowhere. Not one time, not one place. Not one time, not one place. What should we do about that? We should really emphasize the importance of being true and real. <laughs> we should really uh, uh, discourage faking it or it not being reverential and serious. Y'all listening? Amen. I am all for somebody raising a hand lifting their voice to praise the Lord. But when it becomes about being heard or when it becomes about being seen, then our heart is not in the right place. When it becomes about being uh, uh, facilitated by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of God inside of us swelling up and the Holy Ghost is enjoying God in you, and you start remembering how unworthy you are, listen, that's a real good time for you to start expressing uh, your gratitude, your celebration, your rejoicing to God in spite of what anybody thinks for the purpose of giving Him glory. Amen. But if you merely just like to be heard, want to be seen, God ain't got no time for that. True worship. True worship. There's a distinction. Lastly, we see the how of worship. We saw the what is worship, the who of worship. Now we see the how of worship. What did Jesus say? They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Y'all listening to me? They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. There's many other objects of worship, is there not? And you can worship them however you want to, but let me tell you something. God receives a specific type of worship. And that's worship that is in spirit and truth. Must, it's an obligatory, if you will, term. Again, it's, it's, the, it's exclusive. It's exclusive. Meaning, this is the only avenue. You're going to worship God? You want God to receive and appreciate your worship to Him? There's a blueprint. There's a map. There's a specific way. It's a balanced way. It's a twofold way. Spirit and truth. Now again, this word spirit, it's not a capital S spirit. And that is important because in the first part of that verse, God is a capital S spirit. But now this second term spirit is a lowercase s spirit. That means there's another distinction, if you will. 
And the distinction is the spirit of God versus the spirit of man. Inside of every single one of us is a spirit. Your heart, your, your soul, your essence, if you will. And God desires that to be the source of where worship initiates. Did you hear me? It's not physical. It's not, it doesn't, listen, it doesn't say they that worship him must worship him bodily and in truth. It says in spirit. There is something about what goes on inside of a man, inside of a lady, in regards to their creator. It says they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. 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 See, that's the exact opposite of what is going on with this liberal, modern, contemporary movement. I, I've been very blessed. Y'all know my heart. Y'all know my stance. And unless the Lord changes it, this will be the stance that I maintain for years to come. If I get asked to preach might near anywhere, I'm, I'm going to show up preach. And in high school, and this was how I was trained, and in high school I was asked to preach at an FCA club meeting. And it was a service, FCA club, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I went and I preached. And when I got there, me, my wife, she was, Heather was my girlfriend at the time. You was there, wasn't you? I think you was there. Middle school Greensburg, wasn't she? You was. Yeah. I think you was, Heather. I think my sisters, my sister was there. I think maybe Zach's sister, Roger, might have been there. Anyway, there was a crowd of us. We showed up and uh, sat in the back because we're Baptists. Somebody say amen. And uh, everybody's kind of mingling. They come by, thank me for coming. Such and such music group was singing. They get up on the stage. They shut the lights off just on the stage. And everybody immediately stood and held their hands like this. I mean, immediately, when the first guitar strum went through, everybody bodily stood and held their hands like this. You see, now that's the problem. They were facilitating their worship bodily without any spirit facilitation. Does that make sense? Is that resonating with y'all? Listen to me. Is that resonating with y'all? We must realize the importance of worship being done in spirit. In spirit. Not only in spirit, but in truth. What is truth? It's that Bible you hold in your hands. It is the authority on all matters of faith and practice. Listen, you just can't do anything and call it worship. Oh, I'll tell you, Brother Shirley, I'll be worshiping this Sunday out on the middle of Lake Cumberland with my bass boat throwing that buzz bait. Yeah, here's the problem. That's not in the Bible. Amen. Amen. That, don't, that don't count. That sounds great. That don't count. That's not worship. Oh, Brother Caleb, I'll be worshiping the Lord. We're going over here and we're going to be having us a shindig. Somebody will probably pray and then we'll watch the football game. Going to have a good old time worshiping the Lord on Sunday. Yeah, that's not worship. Why? Truth. What is truth? It's God's word. It's God's word. It's just that simple. God's word and the Lord Jesus is truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. This produces worship. We make a couple statements. I want y'all to listen to me. I'm about done. Theology produces doxology. Y'all listening to me? Theology produces doxology. You say, what is doxology? Well, that's praise. Doxology is, is praise. It's, it's the act of praising God. And the, the, rem, or the, uh, the standard of praise We don't believe in trying to speak in some unknown tongue that the angels talk in. Why? Because of theology. What's that? The study of God's word. 
truth. Truth prevents us from saying when somebody falls out on the floor and goes into convulsions and claims that they're having a vision that that ain't got nothing to do with God's word and that ain't worship. Man. Man. Theology produces doxology. We read and we study God's word and guess what it does? It, it makes you, you're going to praise him. If you're going to study God's word, you're going to find yourself lifting up praise to God. Doctrine produces devotion. Doctrine does. It's a lot said, y'all. I don't know if any of y'all has ever heard some of this kind of talk. Listen to me. Some of this phraseology. But many love to talk about having these ecumenical, meaning no standard of denomination or anything like that, ecumenicalism. A lot of ecumenicalism believes in Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, we're all the same. It's wicked. But a lot of these non-denominational church fellowships will get together and they'll say, we're going to have services. We're going to have somebody speak, never preach, speak. We're going to have special music and, and you won't have to worry about doctrine. It ain't going to be nothing about doctrine, only about Jesus. And that sounds great, but guess what? Doctrine's in the Bible. The literal word doctrine's in the Bible. And God puts, puts a precedence on doctrine. And God wants us to realize the importance of knowing what we believe and why we believe what we believe. And when we start learning what the Bible says, why we believe what we believe, guess what will start happening in the life of that person? You'll start seeing them expressing praise and worship to God uh, more often and without a shame or without embarrassment before their friends or before their neighbors. Why? Because they're becoming more aware of the importance of God and look here, and they're abandoning uh, the worship of their own flesh and their own desires. Amen. You start seeing a young man work his way up, doing good, trying to live for the Lord. You see him start taking steps back. Guess what you're going to find out? He ain't reading his Bible. He ain't spending very time in prayer. He's going to school and he's putting a different mask on while he's there. He's not, he's not a Christian at school. He's just a dude. He don't put a Bible, a King James, under his arm while he's at school. I've seen it time and time again. We get them in the summertime. We get them, look here, we take them to our teen camps, our youth rally. We take them to these things. They straighten up. They clean up. They get them a Bible. They get in the choir. They get faithful, and school starts back, and hey, and within a month, you can't find them with the FBI. Why? 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 Because they ain't depending on truth. They're only dependent on spirit. It's a balance. I said there's a balance. Some churches are full of spirit, not an ounce of truth. What do you find? Charismatic. They're going to be charismatic. They're going to be holiness. They're going to end up some kind of non-denominational. Anything and everything goes. Put a woman behind the pulpit. Let her preach. That ain't in the Bible, is it, church? Amen, amen. Let's speak in this tongue. Ain't nobody knows what's being said. For all we know, they're cussing us out in Japanese. Amen. I'm being, look here, why? Because doctrine matters, not just spirit. You got to have truth. And then you got churches full of truth. Full of truth. No spirit. Nothing coming out of man. Nothing in the essence of man. Are you listening to me? Right. Nothing. What do you have? Cold, dead, a lot of times Calvinist. A lot of times they're going to end up Calvinist. Because they ain't got no way to reach nobody. And so they get convinced why God must just save man and we don't have anything to do with it. Are y'all listening to me? Spirit and truth. You know what Jesus said? He that worshiped the Lord God, the Father, must Worship him in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. 
You guys want to express your praise to God? Get back in the Word. Spend time reading the Bible. I, I've said it a million times. I, I know I probably beat a dead horse, but I wonder how many of us would stand today and say, I feel like I read a pretty good amount of the Bible. Read every day this week. If we went around the room and said, where are you at in your Bible reading? How many of us would have a legitimate spot and say, this is where I'm at right now? Y'all listening? You want to you wanna praise the Lord? You want to feel the fire? You can't have it without truth. You want to enjoy the word of God, enjoy the truth of God's word? It's got to come from in here. Jesus said, he that cometh to God, or rather, he that worship him must, it's exclusive, must worship him in spirit and truth, head and heart. Martin Luther, that great reformist, said this, the greatest exposition or exhibit, exhibition, the greatest exhibition of worship is during the expounding of God's word. You know what many of us think of when we think of worship is we think of song, singing, praise. Martin Luther was a hymn writer. That's what he did, man. He loved to write music. And you know what he said? Greatest exhibition of worship is while the word of God is being expounded upon. In Sunday school, on Wednesday evening Bible study, Sunday morning, Sunday night, listen to me. You know what we need? We need that book. We need that book book we need more of it we ain't got enough of it and I don't think we'll ever get enough of it if you agree with me say amen, amen. Lord brother Shirley I, I want to worship him get back in the book brother Shirley I want it to be real let God work in you the real worship of him and don't you dare ever try to manufacture such a thing let's bow our heads Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you.